So in this video, I'm going to spend some time just discussing the general idea of um, our architecture of our ARM processor, as well as getting familiarized a little bit with the development environment that I'm going to be using in this set of videos, which is actually um, the CPU later emulator. This emulator is available online for free, so you can access it um, from pretty much any computer. And Inside of this emulator, we have a lot of different uh, different architectures that exist for us. The one that we're mainly interested in is ARM v7. Um, if you're familiar with MIPS or any other assembly language like that, you'll see that those emulators are also available for you. Um, but generally, we're going to be working in an ARM v7 architecture. And specifically in this set of videos, I'm going to demonstrate the ARM v7 DE1 SoC. Um, so this will be the one that we'll utilize uh, throughout this series of videos. So I'll press go and we'll head into that emulator. Um, just to note, if you're following along, you can follow along through the emulator here, or you can follow along on your own computer if you have an ARM processor of some sort. Any V7 processor, you'll be able to follow along fine with. Even earlier ones, you'll probably be able to follow along relatively well. Um, the main goal of this video is not just to teach you ARM-based assembly, but also to teach you the general principles of assembly so that you can easily um, adapt to any other assembly language, things like x86, um, other versions of ARM, and so on like that. So in general, the principles that you learn throughout this series of videos are going to apply to really any assembly language, um, with the syntax specifically being targeted towards ARM processors. So when we get into our emulator, there are a few things that we have available to us. Well, there's actually like a lot of things on the screen that we have available to us. And I'm going to walk you through some of the essential pieces that we need uh, just to get started. So the first idea that I'm going to introduce to you is the idea of registers, which we see over here on the left hand side. Registers are areas in memory that are very close to the CPU. So they can be accessed quickly and they can be written to quickly. So the general storage is going to be relatively fast. However, we have a limited amount of things that we can store inside of these registers. You'll notice that there's eight zeros inside of this register. Each zero represents a single hexadecimal value. Now, if you know about hexadecimal, you'll know that hexadecimal is going to represent um, four bits. So each hex value represents four bits of data. Since there's eight hex values, each one represents four bits, we have a total of 32 bits that we can work with. This is because this general processor is a 32-bit processor. So we're going to be working in 32 bits, and that's the constraint of how much we can store in a single register, is 32 bits worth of data. We'll often refer to 32 bits as a word in terms of the size. So if you ever hear me refer to as you know changing a word's worth of data, I'm referring to 32 bits of data. The idea of a word transitions to other assembly languages as well, and it generally represents the total like max size of data that could be stored in a register. So for instance, if you were in a 64-bit processor, a word would be 64 bits in size. And then we have the concept of a half word, which is half the size of a word. So in 32 bits, a half word is 16 bits because it's half of 32. In 64 bits, a half word is 32 bits because it's half of 64. And then of course we have a byte, which is always eight bits. And then we have a single bit of data. So those are sort of the different sizes that we have available to us. So in general, when we're working in assembly, we wanna to try to use these registers as much as possible. So all of these registers are going to be available to us, um, with the exception that some of them are going to have special purposes associated with them that we'll discuss um, as we start to see those special purposes later on. In general, I can say that um, registers R0 to R6 are general purpose. We can use them for whatever storage we'd like to use them for. R7 is going to have a special functionality to us related to system calls. Essentially, when we, when we are working with assembly, sometimes we need to talk to the operating system and we need to ask it for maybe a resource or we need to ask it to terminate our program. When we you know, call to the operating system to ask it to do something for us, it needs to know what we're asking it to do. And the way that we communicate that is by storing a value in R7. And that value will be some numeric value that it will map in a table to some, some specific like action. So for instance, if I store the value 1 in R7 and then I interrupt the program, the operating system will read that and interpret it as end the program. So that's an example of how we might use that. Um, so that's one example of a special purpose register that we have. Now, there are other special purpose registers that are actually labeled in this emulator, um, SP, LR, and PC. 
SP is a really interesting one, which is related to the stack pointer. And that actually introduces us to our next important concept, which is the concept of stack memory. If you head over to the memory section here, you'll see that you have a whole bunch of memory available to us. And this is referred to as stack memory. Stack memory is typically stored in the RAM of the computer. And essentially, it's slower to access and slower to write to. However, we can store a lot more data in RAM comparative to data in registers. You'll typically see stack memory used when we want to represent more complex sets of data. Think of something like a list of numbers, for instance. If I were representing a list of numbers, I could give each location in memory a specific number, and then I can iterate through those memory locations to get those numbers. That would be an example of when we might use stack memory. So the SP register is always going to be telling us the address of the next available piece of memory on the stack. So in this case, you see it's pointing to all zeros, which means that we are sitting at this location here. Now, in order to determine like the actual locations, um, we can think a little bit about like where each address is. So this one is zero. We can ask, what is the address next to this? It's always going to be four larger than the previous. So this is at address zero. This would be at address four. This would be at address eight. This would be at address 12. And then we land here at address 16. Now you might look at this and say, well, it says one zero, isn't that 10? Um, remember that we're working in hex. One zero in hex is 16 in decimal. So just keep that in mind that you're always working in hexadecimal. So that's just something to keep in mind there. And that's the way that our stack memory grows. And you'll get really familiar with stack memory. We're gonna work with it a lot throughout this series of videos. So um, you'll get a really good understanding of this as you continue to work with it. The LR register is another interesting one. Um, it's known as our link register. And the best way to describe this is if you've ever worked in a higher level language before, you'll know that when you have a function, a function has a return. And that return allows us to move back to the location of what called the function. That's what the link register stores. It stores the location that a function should return back to. So we'll see that when we talk about functions um, in future videos. And then finally, the PC is our program counter. What this does is it keeps track of the location of the next instruction to execute. So all of our instructions are stored in memory, like all the different uh, uh, things that we're asking the program to do. And the program counter allows us to move through piece by piece and um, determine where the next instruction is going to be located. So those are three really important registers to keep in mind. And like I said, some of these other registers have special purposes as well. And we'll discuss those as they become relevant to us as we continue on through this. The one final thing that I'll discuss here is our CPSR register and our SPSR register. Our CPSR register is a special type of register that is used to store information about our program. So an example of some of the information that it might store. If you subtract two numbers from each other, you might end up with a negative number. Now, if you remember in binary, when we want to represent negative numbers, we need to use what's known as two's complement. Two's complement essentially, um, you know, it goes through some conversion mechanism in order to convert us into that format. Um, we have to do the one's complement, and then we do the two's complement, and we end up with um, some number that represents a negative number. The issue is that that number could also be a positive number. So it's both positive and negative, but we need to know whether or not it's representing like a negative number or it's just a really large positive number. That's where our CPSR register comes in. What it will do is it will set a flag in memory to say the result of the previous operation was negative. We can then take a look at that register and say, if the result was negative, interpret this as a negative number, otherwise interpret it as a positive number. That's sort of the purpose of the CPSR register. It has a whole bunch of flags sort of similar to that that tell us special information about the operations. You know, if a result was negative, if a result was zero, if a result had a carry or an overflow, those are the sorts of ideas that we would typically see. So we'll see those again as we continue on um, learning about the different operations. So this gives you a general overview of some of the important components that we need to start programming in ARM assembly. And in the next video, we'll take a look at how to create a really basic um, assembly program. So that's what we'll take a look at next.